do that and we'll get started okay so hopefully you guys can uh, see my screen uh, it should say making the leap transitioning to a non-clinical career my name is dr. Mike Wuming. I'm um, with income.md and over the next uh, 45 minutes I want to basically just basically have a conversation uh, this is uh, I'm going to be sharing you my experience of when I left non-clinical medicine in 2004, um, and and also I'll talk about my own experiences as a coach uh, for um, other doctors uh, through my own uh, consulting, as well as I uh, also consulted for nonclinicaljobs.com, um, as well as other friends and doctors who have actually made the leap, and so. A lot of what I'm going to be covering, you know, is just basically my own experiences, but I'll also be sharing you um, some things that some of my other colleagues who decided to make the leap and, and how they went through. And and the main main thing they want to get across, too, is that there's not a lot of information on it. And there's really, um, it's very difficult to, you know, go through this type of process, you know, unlike becoming a doctor. You know, we all know we pretty much had to go through the same steps as, you know, college and then uh, take in the, the MCATs or some type of entrance exam for medical school, and then going into medical school and, and most likely residency for many of us. So it was easy for, for us because we have a given path we have to do. Making that transition, either being early out of college or out of uh, medical school, or men, you find in through midlife in your career that you want to make a change, there's really no set pattern. But what I hope to accomplish over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour are some things that I've learned throughout the way that can help you avoid perhaps paying thousands of dollars, you know, thousands of hours in, in time that I've done. And hopefully, um, just by being here, you might pick up a few nuggets that'll help you along the way. And that really is my goal, uh, you know, of the webinar, what we have today. Um, so this was basically saying that we're really in a precarious position in terms of where medicine is these days. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, at the time of this recording, we've got a really big presidential election coming about. We don't know what's going on. Um, some of us may be affected through the previous administrations or the current administration's uh, um, view on, on health care. Uh, many of us might be flying you know, feeling declining reimbursements, working long hours. These are things that I probably don't have to tell you. You probably have talked to your own colleagues about what's what's going on. Uh, if you're on this webinar, you are most likely you're on it because you are considering making a transition or perhaps you are um, in the state of transition uh, and don't know where to go or, you know, maybe trying to find out what else is out there or, you know, maybe you're already working and just want to know what else is going on and, what else is available. And my job is to help uh, you today to understand that we are in a crossroads. Um, now, being interested in a non-clinical job, and I'll kind of go through that definition of what that exactly means, but it certainly is something that a lot of doctors would want to do. Uh, according to this article, as many as 50% would choose to work in a non-clinical job if they could. Um, I've seen statistics come across my desk, you know, 40 to 50 percent, if they could retire, would do so in the next three years. Uh, many doctors would not tell their own children to not go into medicine. Um, you don't see job dissatisfaction rates in other careers. It seems that to medicine is certainly one that, uh, you know, attributes to that. And why is that? There's lots of different factors, um, you know, too much so to go on through this call. Um, but, you know, looking at it from another perspective, from non-doctors looking at it, is like, why are you guys so upset? Why are you guys so unhappy? It's not, you know, I don't think it's just attributed just to our career, but there are certainly there are different factors as to why this occurs. Um, but here are some of the things that I've, I've heard uh, and what I felt myself when I, when I made the switch is... Why do doctors want to switch to non-clinical? No patients. <laughs> um, we didn't come into medicine not wanting to see patients, but perhaps there are certain patients that uh, have led to burnout, and there, you know, there are now whole 
curriculum. There's whole industry related now to physician physicians who burn out or physicians who are um, dissatisfied or uh, there are a lot of different reasons as, as to why this is occurring. Um, perhaps you're not burnt out, but you want to see what else is out there. Maybe you want to, maybe you love your patients, but you want to see what else is there. Um, maybe you're interested in business. I was interested in, in business. I started my own business when I was in residency, um, you know, on the side. Maybe you're interested in technology. Uh, you're interested in what's going in, in IT. Certainly there's now movement. Uh, I read a recent article earlier this year um, that uh, Stanford medical graduates now, one of their issues that uh, people are having is, is then they're not, they're not going into residency. They're going into some internet startup and, you know, perhaps they're looking for their path to wealth going through that way. Maybe you still want to be involved in medicine, but now in different ways. Maybe you want to be involved in public policy or being in admin medical administration. Maybe you've got a master of uh, business or a master of public health and feel that you can help more by being in, in a, non-clinical setting. Um, uh, for, me, for many of us, there's perhaps you've had a life change. Um, this, I'll talk about my own experiences, but uh, you know, I certainly know um, doctors who become pregnant and, and um, have a different uh, desire to, to stay home. Uh, maybe you uh, knew a surgeon who became disabled um, and can no longer do surgery anymore and looking for different means. So there's a number, number of different reasons. Everybody has their own different reasons. Um, but one thing that I, I want to share with you is, is that this is really, what's the reality? What is the reality of non-clinical jobs? The reality that I've seen, and again, this is just through my own experiences. I've been consulting with doctors since oh, 2007. And that many will desire to do it, but unfortunately, few, or fortunately, few will pursue this, meaning they live on someday island. What is someday island? You know, someday island is when someone says, you know, I'm a busy radiologist, but someday I'll become a medical uh, writer. I want to pursue my writing career. Uh, you know, someday I'll... Um, I'll be involved in uh, telemedicine, but right now I've got a busy pediatric uh, career. I've got tons of patients. I can't let them down. Even though I'm unhappy, uh, I'm going to still continue doing it. Uh, the problem is continuing to be unhappy can lead to dire you know, consequences. Um, I remember a few years ago I had a phone call with a radiologist. Uh, and uh, she was telling me that uh, she uh, she wants to uh, pursue a non-clinical job, just wants to see what else is out there. Uh, Samai Sai gave me a call and wanted to talk, living, quote, vicariously through me, unquote, which is, which is uh, pretty funny. But um, I asked her, well, why do you want to do instead of being a radiologist? She said, I just want to do anything else. And she goes, because I'm depressed. Well, I go, well, how long have you been depressed? Because I've been depressed for 25 years. Okay. Maybe that's something that I probably can assist with and would probably need professional assistance. But, you know, there is a reason why uh, some of my colleagues who are involved in physician burnout are very, very busy is because, you know, if you're in a situation, if you're in a job that you hate, you need to get out of that job. Uh, and it's no question about it. And, and find something different. It may not be her job. I think it was something else. And I go, well, what, if you hate what you're doing, why do you continue to wake up? And, and, you know, she says, well, you know what? As soon as I wake up, I have that dread, that feeling of dread coming over my body in there. And then when does the dread leave? It's when I get home. And when you like, what do you like doing in life? And he says, one, I'm not working. I said, well, that's a different situation. You need to and I, I pointed, I gave her uh, a referral to somebody that she should see. And I go, you know, before you do anything, you need to examine what's going on in your own life. And I go, well, why, why do you want to be a radiologist if you, if you hate what you're doing? 
He says, I can't. I said, why can't you? Because it makes too much money and I've got too many things that I want, I need to have. And he gave me different reasons why. And, uh, and I said, you know, certainly there are some people who, you know, I, I even read in a recent physician forum that, you know, they go in and they uh, hate what they're doing. <laughs> Well, they hate what they're doing. I don't mean to laugh, but they um, they only like it when they come home. And I said, I would hate to be in a position where I go to a job where I hate what I'm doing. Certainly what I'm doing right now, um, you know, there's no, it's not all uh, roses and sunny days. You're going to have ups and downs. But at the end of the day, I love what I'm doing. I, I love what, you know, I've done. And uh, um, so... I think that's the first part is to examine in yourself what you have to do. So here's what we're going to be covering uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm going to kind of limit to 45, 50 minutes if I can. Uh, a lot of info to cover. But I'm going to talk about the three common myths about non-clinical jobs and what you need to know about the reality of the situation. Number two, what's the one thing you need to do before conditioning, consider transitioning to a, another job? I'll give you a few examples of non-clinical jobs that you can get started to immediately. There are tons of different non-clinical jobs that you can do. And then for those who want to pursue this further, I do have an opportunity uh, for those who want to uh, work with me and go further down and helping them with their non-clinical career path. So um, the first part is you need to know the uh, six Ps. Proper planning prevents piss Poor performance. We've all heard this. This is, comes out, I think it was out of the uh, uh, IT uh, agency. And a lot of times when I see um, doctors look for non clinical careers, they don't know where to start. And they look and they say, no, I don't like it. They say, oh, it doesn't pay a lot and I want to do something else. You have to have a plan. And for many, of you who are working right now, it should be six months to a year sometimes um, trying to make the transition. It's not easy. Um, even if you want to leave, there are certain circumstances where you can't leave. You know, medicine is not a give a two week notice that you're gone and you and you go. You kind of have some type of planning, and it's you know if you have a if it's not if you just, if it's not if you don't have a family. It might be a lot easier, but if you've got a family with kids and, and a spouse and other responsibilities, you know, it's, you got, you have to plan. You have to see what's out there. Um, depending, depending on what uh, type of non-clinical job you want to do, you might, you know, let's say your dream job is become a medical administrator, but then you look at other jobs and they have certain requirements that you need to have. You know, those are things that you need to have put in place before even applying or even considering doing something like that. So. Um, Hopefully this call will uh, short uh, give you a shortcut to some of these things. It's not going to be for the weak of heart. Uh, we're going to be discussing things that not a lot of doctors like to talk about. Um, you know, these type of there's a reason why uh, you don't see a lot of presentations at CME meetings about non clinical jobs. <laughs> it's because they don't want you to talk about it. Not only administrators. Uh, even some of your fellow doctors may not want to consider. They might want to think about it a lot and like dream about it. Um, a lot of doctor recruiters don't want you to find you know jobs uh, in, in non-clinical careers. Um, the important thing is, and this is something that I'll touch on, you know, throughout this career, throughout this presentation, is that you know each one of you have value. You have, one of you have something to offer, and. And this might, it might seem kind of funny that, uh, you know, I'm saying this, but, you know, I see a lot of people, doctors say, you know, all I know to do is become a doctor. That's all I, that's all I know how to do. And they suffer what I call the fallacy of sunk costs. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but that somehow just by being a doctor, they're not good at any other job. And that's not true at all. Um, doctors are, are great communicators. They have, uh, you know, we, we've been trained at, at understanding, you know, others. Maybe not just through 
communication as in a verbal communication, but understanding body language, understanding uh, their thought processes, understanding the motives of, of folks, and then then communicating, being able to communicate in terms of making complex um, conditions uh, and simplifying that and communicating that. Maybe and you, maybe you work with children and being able to communicate very things very, very simply. Maybe you work with adults who may act like children and having to do the same thing. Uh, make, maybe you work doctor to doctor through with radiology and, and being able to communicate that way. Those are great examples of becoming writers and creating uh, uh, course curriculums. So, each, so don't diminish yourself. And again, it sounds silly, but you'd be surprised what I've had to do as, in, as a career consultant. So first off, why should you listen to me in the first place? Why are you spending your time with me, right? You know, listening in the first place? Um, you know, there wasn't a uh, a course I took in medical school in terms of non clinical careers, and it's something that I even envisioned when I was uh, applying to medical school or even residency. I know for I know these days that the residents are thinking about non clinical careers. I see it on some of the student doctor boards uh, and articles that come out. But um, really what it was is, you know, my story is um, I'm a San Diego, uh, California, uh, um, not born and raised, I was born in Ohio, but raised in California from a family of doctors. My dad was a pediatrician. My uncle was a thoracic surgeon. My cousin is a dermatologist. Um, another cousin who is a psychiatrist, uh, who's actually, um, um, I've talked to, is, who is now uh, out of medicine. Uh, but uh, when I started uh, you know, thinking about uh, medicine, it's always been at an early age, and there wasn't anything else that I could uh, you know, have done. Um, went into primary care when it was still fashionable to do so, um, and uh, went into uh, uh, went to the Mayo Clinic in uh, family medicine, and uh, went to uh, San Diego uh, to practice out of suburban San Diego, where I continued to live in. And um, basically... Um, I worked first job out of residency in a uh, group practice where it was mostly primary care. We had some OBs and we had some PEDS and it was uh, kind of the, uh, you know, really the, the, uh, outlier in terms, at least when I was there in that we had to do everything. So, uh, they didn't believe in a hospitalist program and I was there. So I was taking, uh, you know, I did, I wore lots of hats. So I was seeing patients, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 40 patients a day. Every few days would be on a call, close out my call um, with 12 admissions, sometimes up to 12 admissions, um, see them in the ER. Uh, I was a urgent care director for them. I was a nursing home. We had three nursing home directors. Um, so we did everything. And um, I did love what I was doing. Maybe it was being naive. Maybe it didn't I didn't know any better. I was making pretty good money. And uh, um, all those things really came into um, a halt when my son was uh, four and he was diagnosed with autism. And, and uh, that was a big shock to my system. And it was, I never went and uh, um, really, you know, took a lot of vacation or anything like that. But it was a big it was a big shock and I wanted to cut down on the amount of hours that I want to work because I wanted to kind of be there and go to all of his, uh, um, therapy and do what I could do. Again, this is, this is, uh, 10 or 12 years ago where, uh, you not a lot of information about, uh, special needs and in terms of autism and that disorder, you know, is came really came to the fruition. And so there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know about that I wanted to be involved in. But when I asked my um, CEO if I could, you know, take, you know, some time off to deal with this, uh, uh, basically, Caden, he says, you know, Mike, we, we need you. You know, how many should you need a day, two? <laughs> you know, I was wearing a lot of different hats. And I said, the only way that I can do this is to have, be in a position where I'm a bit more flexible in my job. And um, uh, I ended up... Uh, because I wasn't able to do it, I ended up quitting, uh, and it wasn't like I could give like a two-week notice. It was a, 
it was a six month grueling process. I mean, not grueling, I mean, they were fine with it, but, um, I was a shareholder of the company, so I had to give up some shares. It was, it cost money to, to leave. Um, and, uh, but I had things in place that I had put in, you know, for the few years, I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I can't say it was completely due to, you know, my son's situation. That certainly was a big, uh, impact on it but it was you know recognition burnout i was seeing a lot more patients um i was seeing them every seven to eight minutes you know i was feeling that you know there's a lawsuit waiting to happen and i wasn't very comfortable and i didn't feel that i was i was performing quality medicine to be honest with you um so i began to explore different opportunities and and understand what else was uh you know what else was out there um so I wanted to focus on, I wanted to focus on, they just told me that you guys can see my screen. So um, I wanted to focus on what else was out there. And I was working 50 to 60 hours a week. So I didn't have really have a lot of time to, you know, go to job interviews. I'm in there. I was just want to see if it was possible. Well, luckily, um, I became savvy on the internet and understood about what else, you know, finding different positions. I remember, um, I would have other positions that I did periodically. Um, so I wrote for a, um, um, a, a dot com, a startup, a health startup, and I wrote some articles. I, st I developed my own uh, company um, over the time. I got involved in, in uh, medical information and uh, I got involved in a, a couple of uh, internet, uh, um, went to a few internet uh, marketing meetings. And I, I found a business partner, and we developed a uh, a small business software uh, company that that I helped run and helped uh, market, and uh, actually became pretty successful with it. And a few years ago, I was able to to sell that. So I had some things in place, but um, and uh, I definitely understood that you know personally that if I don't do things. I'm the only one who can control what I wanted to do. And if I didn't, I need to find else what else was out there. And when I left, you know, some of the colleagues that, you know, basically thought it was nuts, probably maybe not to my face, but behind my back, um, they actually got mad. A few of them got mad, you know, at me. And I don't think it was at me. It was just maybe, I, I think mad is a strong word, but maybe it was just, Maybe a bit of jealousy. I don't know what it is. You know, this was, and I didn't have anything to be jealous about. I was just, I just needed to do something different and I needed to, to get out of that situation. So um, I left medicine in 2004. I learned early on, I was, for me, I was unemployable. And, um, um, you know, I I was out of there for, for, for a bit. Then I, as I was involved in, in, in activities such as being a, a not clinical career coach, um, it was a really a chance encounter that made me love medicine again. And, and what that was, was, um, in certain States, you have to maintain seeing patients in, uh, with your medical license. This is something, again, no, this is, no one really talked to you about this kind of stuff. And so I had a, a client who was in Texas, she was telling me that she'd been out of medicine for a while and they were making her, the state was making her go to some type of class, some type of medical school, to be honest with you, and that she would have to pay up to $50,000 to go to school because she'd been out of practice for so while. And, you know, talking with another colleague of mine who also had left uh, practice, he says, whatever you can do, if you can see patients, even once a month, um, you want to do that because you need to understand what there might be some state laws where you could actually uh, lose your license if you don't practice and see a few minute patients. So that woke me up right away. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to, I need to do this. So I remember it was funny. I was remember I was, I was working in my office and I said, I'm going to need to take these Mondays and Tuesdays off. Because why? Because I have to go see patients. And I, I took like a, a six week locum tenens job. And <laughs> for me, and it was like, um, somehow they hired me. Cause I don't know how, but um, 
because we've been there so long. And I went into this area, it drew two hours to get there. And within 45 minutes, I figured everything basically go, no, nope, this is not what I want to do again. Um, and uh, I finished that job. And then I said, well, if I'm going to do, do medicine, I want to do it my own terms. So what I did was um, I started up my own clinic, took some money that I made from my software company. I own my own um, Currently, I own my own age management practice. We do weight loss. Uh, I started a med spa. I work have a mid level physician's assistant. Does you know most of the work, um, and then I helped uh, other uh, co own another weight loss clinic, and that lets me to be more in terms of what I like to do is like managing. You know, I still see uh, patients on the side, but I'm doing it on my own terms. I also run a medical marketing company and a media company as well. Um, I'm not saying that this is something that, you know for you, but it works for me. Uh, but allows me to be be my own boss and kind of the things that I want to do. But whatever that you want to do, I believe anybody can do this as long as you have the right mindset and as long as you plan correctly. Um, but that's a little bit about me. Let's focus on um, you know some things that I wanted to do. And one of the things that I wanted to do was. I wanted to do a quick poll, um, and I didn't have time to set this up. So um, if you wouldn't mind, I want you to um, go into the little chat, and um, let's see what I can do here. If you could tell me maybe a little bit like if you're, uh, if you're already in a non-clinical career, or if you are... Uh, just looking. Um, so if you're in a non-clear clinical career now, just put uh, yes. And if, if not, just put no. Okay, if you can go into the chat room, just so I have an idea. If you can't, it's in that little uh, box under, a, under that. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm getting some answers in here. Okay, and I know it's a kind of a small sample size here. So yes, I'm in an uncle career. No, I'm considering it. Okay. Okay, so it looks like a minority of you are in one. That's fine. And, and two-thirds of you looks like are, so that's great. So um, here are some things that I want to share with you. First, number one is, uh, myth number one is uh, there are no jobs available and only the good ones are taken. I hear this a lot. Um, you'd be surprised if how many non-clinical jobs um, are available. Now, the, the thing is, is that most of them aren't necessarily advertised, right? Just like as in most jobs, good jobs aren't, aren't advertised. Um, a lot of them aren't filled, uh, to be honest with you. Um, now, it certainly isn't as much as, let's say, you were in primary care. Um, I actually have a... Uh, you know, one thing, if you're getting caught up with one of these local tenants company, never give them your phone number because if they give you your phone number, you won't have a phone. So they call in a, uh, I don't have a home phone, so they call into a, a phone that goes into a voicemail that, and um, I need to fix it because every time I check it, it's always filled up. Um, but there's lots of jobs in, in primary care. Uh, but maybe let's say you're in a, a, a super specialty that doesn't have a lot of positions. In general, um, there are lots of jobs, but they're not necessarily saying non-clinical jobs. It could be under the auspices of medical administrator or uh, health writer or um, uh, you know, utilization management uh, director. Um, but you know, I just looked up, uh, for example, I looked up a, a site just before we got on this call. And it was a site called Upwork, and uh, which is a freelance site where it's basically a site if you're looking for um, not necessarily a, a job, but what they call a gig, you know, a short-term assignment. I saw like 160 medical writing jobs that were available as of this morning. Various different amount of pay, you know, um, some were in the hundreds of range, some were in the thousands of dollars of range, depending on what they wanted. But there is ones if you go through a process, and I'll give you some resources where you can go to find some of these. But a lot of them, unfortunately, is being able to going to uh, 
putting out your your calling card, putting out your uh, your sign that you're available, and going to different conferences, business conferences. Um, for example, there's the medical writer conference is coming up next month, and just being available and and taking the time to go through these these areas. Uh, so you just need to be make yourself available and to know where to look. Um, some sites that I, I can share with you. Um, dropoutclub.org is a site. Or is it? I believe it's. Uh, sorry, I think it's .com. It's one of those. Now that I'm thinking about it, um, but that's a site that uh, lists a lot of. Uh, uh, so it's not only for MDs, but PhDs. It's free. You have to register. Uh, my friend Joe Kim owns a site called nonclinicaljobs.com. It just scrolls down. Uh, you can see a ton of different sites there. Another, another one that I recently uh, got looked at was healthecareers.com is another. And then there are the big job sites like indeed.com, monster.com. Um you can also go through my website, IncomeHub.md. Uh, it's really recently gone through a facelift, um, but I'm going to be adding some non-clinical um, sites, uh, sites that are interested for doc, docs interested in non-clinical jobs uh, as well that uh, I'll be making available. So any of these, I'll uh, have links to them so you can, you can uh, take a look at that. Um, and then a lot of them do have a, uh, like a notification, for example, in Indeed. Uh, if something comes up, you can put in an email notification. If there's a search term like, let's say, physician consultant, it'll then uh, email you, uh, you know, jobs, and then you can click on those. Common myths about non-clinical jobs. Myth number two, I'm going to need to take a drastic pay cut. I need to take a drastic pay cut. Um, now, this one is a myth, especially if you're a primary care physician. Because the average pay for a lot of these uh, positions are in the are equivalent to what a primary care physician is. Now, if you're a you know orthopedic surgeon, um, you know that might be, or a, a neurosurgeon that may be that may be true that there may be a pay cut. But you know, if you want to become an entrepreneur and start your own business, well, we're really there. You know, the pay is you know limitless. Perhaps you get involved as a consultant in a startup where you have stock involvement, and there are, you know, there is a, uh, a society called the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs that I was involved with, where they're looking for doctors, uh, where you have startups come in and they're looking for doctors as to be on the board or be on a, a committee or a health advisor, where they may pay you in stock, and who knows what that may pay. Uh, but you also need to be uh, know is that many of these uh, positions, not a lot, but some of these positions involve with you actually never leaving your home. Uh, there are things that you can do, such as telemedicine, which by its definition is not considered not clinical, but certainly is an option for many. Um, there's a tons of jobs in, in telemedicine these days, depending on what you want to do and what your comfort level is, and you never have to leave uh, you know, the home. Um, some of them, though, may be only uh, part-time um, positions, but certainly there are a number of part-time positions that you could do that could... could you know, in the grand scheme of things, could outweigh your full-time position. Sure, you may need to get your medical insurance, you know. These days, I think I've seen a number of people who stay on jobs just because they've got a good medical insurance. You know, you can have your own insurance on there. It's, it's a cost just as anything else. You can have the best medical insurance that you want. You just be able to get out, sometimes get out of that employee uh, mindset on there. Uh, they've done... And, you know, uh, again, I'm not going to talk about being an employee versus being an unemployee. Uh, you know, there they have studies looked at this, but in general, there are, it seems to be a little bit higher sat job satisfaction from uh, from an employee going to an, uh, a non-employee position or an independent contractor position than vice versa. Again, whatever it is, whatever your comfort level, we'll go through um, kind of a little checklist that you should do before considering what needs to be involved. Um, but what this uh, slide is making remember is, one, is that I need to start watching the show a little bit more. <laughs> but uh, if any of you are fans of the show Breaking Bad, you are probably have uh, heard of the spinoff called uh, Better Call Saul. And, uh, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is the story, this, the, the, uh, uh, the show is about this lawyer. It's kind of a, kind of a, I'm not going to use the word sleazy. He does have a, he's a, down and out lawyer, but he's kind of got a heart of gold. 
um, and gets involved in different situations. And but in an episode that occurred earlier this year, um, he was talking with his colleague, I think it was girlfriend, and uh, he at the part of the show he said he was going to leave his profession as an attorney. And she was telling him, why would you want to do this? Why do you want to quit? You spent so much time studying for the bar. You paid all this money, and you're just going to throw it all away. And he said, no. He says, what you believe is the fallacy of sunk costs. And what the fallacy of sunk costs is that you basically you're throwing money just for the sake of throwing money and hope that your luck turns better. And he gives the analogy of a gambler who... Will sit, will stay at the table, because you know keep putting in money, even though he's still losing. He'll keep putting in money because someday it's got to turn. And and what that what that illustrates is the fallacy, what they call the fallacy of sunk costs. And I see doctors do this a lot. Is that the tendency to keep doing something more, even though it doesn't make sense, just because you've already paid for it. And it's very very common. Uh, you know, common mindset to get out of in career change, and especially with doctors. The feeling is, you know, I spent so much time in doctor, well, I mean, by becoming a doctor, I might as well keep doing it, right? Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the reason why uh, we get certified. Uh, you know, even though I'm a uh, neurosurgeon and I no longer do that, but because I spent all this time and money doing it, Somehow I've lost something, and if I don't even, even though I hate doing what I'm doing, I'll just still do it. And that's only again. This is this is not just uh, with doctors, but I hear this with doctors a lot, and that's why you end up being. Um, that's why we end up being uh, miserable sometimes because we feel that we have to do it. What we don't realize is that life is short. We all can make decisions. We all can do what they they want to do. But I've yet to hear someone say, um, when it comes to retirement, they say, well, I shouldn't say never, but you know what? I spent so much time and money working that I might as well do it till the day I die <laughs> and not retire. Um, it doesn't happen. And that so that's the thing is, is that even if you spent time and money doing it, uh, you know, you just don't want to sp spend it just to spend it. Sometimes you have to uh, walk away. You know, I saw this yesterday. Um, I have a, a car. It's pretty, it's a high-end car, but uh, I just paid, you know, the, the, you know the, I spilled something in the engine and I was like, oh, okay, great. And, uh, it's been, and uh, you know it's another twenty five hundred dollars, and I keep saying, you know, why do I keep spending money on this? And it's like, ah, oh, you know what? It's kind of like this is what you have to do. And then there, when like I keep saying, is why can't I just ditch this car, throw it over the cliff, and get a new one? Um, so sometimes we have to uh, learn from our own mistakes. That's something I hear frequently with doctors. And then the third myth is, I'll be looked down upon my family and friends. Um, I certainly see this a lot with cultures. Uh, I've certainly seen this in my own family with being in a family of doctors that somehow will be looked down. It was interesting. It was uh, my father was when, when I told my mom that, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to to quit doing this. You know, she was told me, no, why do you want to do this? Uh, and basically it almost came back to like, how will other people, other my friends will perceive me if you leave? That <laughs> kind of thing. Or, uh, but my dad was more, um, he was more uh, sympathetic because it was something that he wanted to do because uh, he was he was in a lot of jobs doctor jobs that he got in and he you know, get, got up he he left he was unhappy and, and moved to something else um, and uh, but for some this is a very important that they'll stay in the job just because they'll somehow they're going to lose face or um, they don't know what the college will think I see this one I don't know what my colleagues will think but the reality is most of them are really not thinking about you. I, and it's, again, it's, it's hard to hear, but, you know, when my colleagues were like, why would you want to do that? You know, um, you know, how would it, what would they think that I do that? You know, they, they're worried about their own lives. And, and until you start realizing is that 
you need to stop caring sometimes what other people are thinking is really the only way that, that uh, I think was, uh, I think Lao, uh, I forgot the philosopher, but it was something to the effect of, uh, you know, unless you stop caring what people are thinking, you'll never be free. Uh, and, and that's so accurate. It's so true. Um, and, and sometimes you have to realize that, that life is short. And sometimes you have to do things for yourself and for whatever is the best for you and your family and for your own mental well-being. Uh, another, so last night I quoted a uh, Chinese philosopher. This one I quote uh, the guy from uh, uh, The Hangover. You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Which leads me to the next slide is that if you're miserable now, why is it? You know, you need to internally look as to see what's going on. Is there other patients that are driving you nuts? Are there staff that are controlling? Uh, is your is it your boss? Is he just a tyrant? Is it the amount of paperwork? Um, some of you saw my statistic um, to help promote this webinar. Is that two hours? Uh, recent studies is two hours of paperwork for one hour of clinical medicine. Do you feel yourself devalued? And I think oftentimes this is the 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 last reason on this slide is why that they somehow they feel devalued. They feel that they don't think things have under control. Um, and realizes that there are some things that you have you have you are in control that you can take care of. Um, and um, you need to understand is that maybe it's not necessarily a non-clinical job that you need, but maybe it's you just need to move into a better job. You know, uh, here was an original poll that I was going to do. How many of you feel that your job rewarding, satisfying, or slowly crushing your soul? <laughs> okay, if it is, it may not necessarily be a non-clinical job you need, Maybe it's a different type of job. Um, if you're in primary care, maybe you hate doing, you know, um, primary care medicine. Well, you can go into an urgent care position. You can do a locum tenens type job. You can, uh, can still be in clinical. You could still enjoy that. But um, before you do anything, the most important thing that you need to have is to do your own assessment of where you are and how it factors in your life. And, it's as simple as taking a blank sheet of paper and doing pros and cons. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you watch The Big Bang Theory and know how Sheldon thinks, that's what he does. Pros versus cons. It might be something, unless you really spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes actually thinking about why, what was really upsetting you? Why was really about, it may not just be just being in a clinical job. It may be things that are related to your clinical job that you hate. Um, and I think in terms of flexibility, um, and dealing with doctors from different generations, it seems to be, and again, I don't mean to generalize, but older, the older generations, uh, the, like, and I count myself in this generation, um, have a harder time dealing with this. That we grew up with the Marcus Welby on TV, or the, uh, you know, the, the 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 doctor who has one job for the rest of his life, the old family doctor. Um, I don't see that with the younger generation. Uh, in a lot of my uh, clinics, we hire mid-level providers like PAs and MPs, and it seems to be a lot easier hiring a PA that's been out five to ten years versus somebody who's straight out of school. Reason being is that they don't know what, what they want to do. They, you know, they might work in our, our weight loss clinic, but they really want to do hospital medicine because that's what they have a calling for, or emergency medicine. They are, uh, they feel that they need to do the, the things. And then when we hire them out of school, they usually, we spend all this money and time training them that they're gone after a year because they want to do something else. It's usually the ones who've been like, okay, I've uh, dotted all my I's, I've crossed all my T's, uh, this is where I want to do. But, you know, days of staying in just one job is kind of falling away of the, the dinosaur, is that it doesn't exist anymore. So, but for you, if someone is like, you know, it's okay to switch to different positions on in there. You know, I think now the average position is about two or three years. Um, but, you know, look at to see, you know, what are the different, what are the different things that are involved into why you want to go to a non-clinical job? Is it the environment? Are you giving too much patient, seeing too many patients? Are you giving too little time to see patients? Uh, is it the type of patients? Uh, that you're at? Is it the, the amount of workload? 
Is it the amount of paperwork? Is it the declining reimbursements? Is it, uh, is it other responsibilities that you weren't made aware of that are part of your job? For example, when I was in, I was in, I was put on different committees you didn't like doing. It was involving two different time commitments, time, taking time away from your family on there. So, so the first question you have to ask yourself is, is it really going into a non-clinical job or is it, can I still do my job, but maybe I can do it differently? Maybe I can work it as a part-time job, still life-saving medicine, but um, maybe I'm in being involved in a in a jo- in a company where they're asking too many things. You know, maybe you're too, you're you. I didn't know really that there was when I was any better that you could take a job without call. Like beyond the video, you know, uh, I didn't realize that there were other companies that had hospitalists to take care of, or they had phone triage. You know, um, so. But for me, um, you know, and, the, and and going that is, can you fix your job? Can you reduce your hours? Can you f- ask for a raise? Um, maybe again, this goes back to not feeling that you are getting a value. Maybe the patience that you have. Um, you know, one thing that really bothered me at my job was um, I was involved in a lot. I had a lot of patients who had, were drug seeking, and again, not fault of their own. On, on many cases, but I felt that I was playing a narcotic roulette sometimes, especially when I had to cover um, patient, uh, cover other doctors who were a bit more, let's say, lenient than others. Um, in terms, in terms of that, I, did, I felt uncomfortable doing that. But you know, maybe in terms of your staff, can you go to your administrator and, and you know get a different staff person or transition to a different job? Again. You need to look at yourselves. Is it the clinical aspect of the job that's bothering you, or is it the, uh, or if it's not, is it there are other areas of the job and, and go to a different different type of job or different company, look elsewhere. It's very important that, that you do this because not clinical jobs is not for everybody. You know, you might have thought this call was all about, you know, everything great about it. It, it certainly can be, but oftentimes it can be just switching your job. And going into a different environment, going to uh, different pastures other than that. But you know, for me, the reasons being was was um, one again. This is just my own biases. This is my own, you know, my own reasoning. One is I was involved in primary care. I didn't like the pay. I thought we were being devalued. I thought that. Uh, didn't like the type of patients, and to be honest, I didn't like the continuity of care. I didn't really need to see. Uh, at times of my job, I I felt that um, it was again, you know, you could. This is still off the cuff. I mean, just, when I was thinking, it was just I felt that I wanted to be able to see a patient. And see them, and then do something else. And I liked involved in the management of it, and I didn't like to have a non-physician telling me what to do. So I'll get off my soapbox, and you know, maybe it was a little bit too much for some, but um, that's that was my that was my my thinking, and I wanted to get out and realizing that now I did really still love helping people, I love medicine, but I'm doing it in, in a different aspects, and. Um, but it's not so much of me actually doing the work. I'm in a different position. In, um, for example, our, our clinics are open today, but I'm talking with you, but you know, um, generating revenue in, in a more passive way that way. So, um, But uh, again, that's just another way of doing it. So the other thing too is if you come to the decision that you want to go into a, a non-clinical uh, route realizing what does it take if i were to leave the job now what is the financial um impact that would occur you may need to have an accountant but you need to look at okay what needs to be replaced mortgages car loans um if you have upcoming events let's say you have a daughter's wedding that could be very expensive maybe you're maybe you have a car that's about to run down you need to get a new car um what are health insurance concerns um uh, if i go from 
being a employee to an independent contractor? Uh, how will that impact me? How will that impact my family? Uh, 401k, other assets. I told you I had to leave a shareholder position, so I, I lost money that way as well. Uh, these all need to be taken into consideration before you do that. Not necessarily just financial assessment. What's the emotional assessment? You know, how is this, if you're married, well, how is that going to impact everybody else? Again, these all need to be done in consideration. And if you're not willing to look at that, it's not worth, looking, worth it to start looking. Um, and I'm going way over time, so I apologize for that. Um, but I will, uh, we're at the end of there. Other things to consider. I mentioned early on that uh, some states say that if you don't see a certain number of patients per month, you might be in jeopardy of losing your license or having to go to some type of school, which require you to pay some money. Uh, that needs to be looked into. How would it affect your malpractice? Uh, board certification. Does it affect, do you want to be involved in board certification? Uh, you will have to do things in terms of the gaps in your uh, resume. Uh, let's say you decide you do an clinical job and you do a clinical job. They might not like that. So these are things that you have to consider. I can't answer that question for you. For every person, it's it's different. You know what what's in terms of, of what you want to do, and that's why that I suggest for many of you who are looking is to make it a gradual process. Um, so number one, if you don't like what you're doing, uh, and you hate what you're doing, if you you know try to fix in your job what you can do. Fix those things that you could do to make it a bit more palatable. If you feel that that uh, you are doing work that, uh, let's say, for example, in an EMR, and you were you were there until eight o'clock at night entering information in an EMR, you know, can you go to your the powers that be and say, hey, I need somebody to put in this information for me? This is taking it away, and. Uh, or I should be paid for those hours for doing this if you're not willing to pay somebody to do this. You know, this is a job that you could hire somebody, a $10 person job, an hour job to do this. Um, if you're not willing to pay me, then you need to pay me my doctor time to be doing this work. And if you're not willing to do it, there are tons of other jobs that allow you to do those types of things. You need to be able to reduce your hours. You need to be able to ask for flexibility. It doesn't hurt if you don't ask. Um, you know, if Saturdays is the time day that you is your day to spend time with your kids and go into their uh, softball games, baseball games, say you know I don't want to go by Saturday. This is what I want to do. This helps my balance on in there. There are always jobs are jobs available. Always can do locum tenants. Uh, always can do part time work on in there. Um, but so those are where I would start doing it. And then if you're looking for non clinical jobs. This is the time we can need to start looking to see what else is out there. Um, so that was my, you know, my story is, um, as I mentioned, when I left, um, I put in my notice of resignation. I didn't leave until six months later um, because one, he said, you know, it's going to take us time. We have to recruit a new doctor. And, you know, I was, I was really nice to them. <laughs> And uh, but it helped with my my pay and severance pay too, and so they they assisted me as well. Um, but if you're looking to do non clinical job, you know there are ways that you can do this on your own without even having to let anybody know. There's this thing called the internet that allows you to search to see what else is out there, and there's tons of different non clinical jobs that are out there, wide variety that you can choose from. Um, uh, you know, there's some that are still clinical. Um, there are jobs that you could do, like in telemedicine. Um, that is big. Go to telemedicinejobs.com. I think it is telemedicine.com. Just type in one search of telemedicine. Lots of different telemedicine type jobs that you can do. Pay very well. Many of them. You could become a medical director where you could uh, be involved and work with other clinics or supervising a, a mid level and, and get a stipend uh, of some sort. Um, uh, I know there's a spelling only there, but some there are other jobs though that do require some expertise and credentialing and require education. It might require you to take some courses before you can do that. If you know medical policy is what you public policy is what you want to do, find out, look at some of the jobs, go to the job boards, see what they require for you to do that. It may be something that you will need to take the time to actually do this 
before you can go and transition and, and start a job. So see, so you know, do your homework, do your due diligence, see what else else is out there. Um, but uh, you know, if you want to show, look at different types of jobs that I, I think that you should that are, are hot um, on my site income income.md. Uh, right now, the main uh, article is on seven trends non physical doctors can do, and I just I just showed you uh, uh, the top seven that I think that are really popular that uh, a lot of doctors should be looking into if they're interested in going into that direction. Um, but uh, for the remaining parts of the call, I just get it quickly. Again, I apologize for going over the hour. I want to highlight a few areas uh, in non-clinical medicine that uh, I think you can get started into immediately that doesn't require you to take spend thousands of dollars at getting uh, you know courses or uh, uh, get certified in. These are areas where you can keep your feet wet in. You know, just you know, dip your toe in in the pool. It's just to see what else is out there. Um, the first one is. Uh, be just being a writer, being a physician writer or blogger. Um, two interesting, and the blogging is 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 very very interesting. Um, you know, physician and, and writing has always been connected. Our job is being able to communicate, to communicate complicated processes and simplifying them, communicating with our patients. So many doctors are actually very very you know good writers, and there's certainly writing courses that are out there that you could take. Um, and this is not necessarily just about becoming a fiction writer, like uh, the Michael Crichtons of the world. Um, certainly, there are doctors who have been uh, very uh, successful at doing that. But there are definitely publishing companies continue to ask for writers, and they understand the built-in um, credibility that an MD or a DO or a initials behind your name have. Um, some areas that you can look at are like the American Medical Writers Association. Uh, get involved with that. Uh, there are Upwork and Freelancer are freelance sites that offer writing engagements. Just look up, you know, uh, I'll put up some more writing resources on the website that you could look into. Um, these are things that you can do at home. You could do it on the side. I remember um, when I uh, was first looking into the things, looking thing into different opportunities, uh, I was involved in health writing uh, for a website. I wrote on different diseases and wrote different articles for the consumers. Then I also wrote in terms of more technical. So I wrote for um, it was uh, it wasn't a Wikipedia, but it was like that. It was a medical encyclopedia uh, that I wrote on different conditions. And then what's interesting is that I ended up liking it so much, liking writing. I ended up getting other businesses and didn't require an MD. Um, so I took a writing gig on writing um, music reviews and uh, uh, movie reviews. Pay wasn't great, but I just enjoyed doing it. And again, it's not necessarily just the pay sometimes, but if you actually like doing it, enjoy, enjoy doing it. Um, but a lot of times you don't even have to rely on the companies now. There's been a big in, influx of what I call uh, or on physician blogs. You may have seen this. Um, there are sites like White Coat Investor and Physician on Fire. And these are blogs, and they, they write about uh, money management and investing and things like that. Um, and basically, these are sites that they where they had a passion about something, and they just started writing about it. And physicians have always been wary about, you know, I don't know, why, but humanizing or feel like if they talk about different aspects that they're uh, commercializing on them. But, you know, there are a lot of doctors and they're willing to put themselves out there. Some have, some not as much, some use a, a pseudonym or a don't say, but they're starting up a blog, um, getting money by advertising, selling advertising on the site because it gets views, or they'll sell their own services um, uh, where they do consulting. Uh, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, and that's something that doesn't require uh, a lot of money to do or just basically time and passion to do. And if, if that's something that you're passionate about and if you've got a topic that you're passionate about and uh, that's something that uh, that you could do. And I'm seeing more and more doing this. And 
they're doing it successfully and it leads to other different things it, it can definitely be, lead lead to uh, um, other different things and it's often just in many respects it's a uh, calling card because when I started my blog I got more um, work because just because I had the expertise of starting a blog um, one of the first things that I did uh, that I did and they didn't call it blog back then back times uh, is I started a medical software uh, reviews uh, page. Uh, this is way early on. And for me, I started this as a resident. I would write reviews on different software products. Um, it was educational software. Uh, well, it was educational software that I did. And I didn't have to pay for anything uh, in terms of like studying for like the USMLE and different things because uh, they would send me the stuff for free uh, to review. And maybe that was a little re <laughs> reason why I started it. But again, I just put myself out there. And if you're passionate about something, you never know how many doors it can open up for you. Because the re at the end of the day, the internet wants more content, continues to add more content. That's And not just content, quality information, quality con content that people you use. Um, and it can also lead into uh, a book. You know, if you want to go, you can become a publisher. You know, there's certainly there are thousands of there's of courses out there that can cost thousands of dollars you teaching you how to write a book. Um, but you know, if you have a know-how, you can use a company like CreateSpace, which is a owned by Amazon, as it says in the upper left, and it's a self-publishing company where you can publish a book uh, for the littlest cost of about ten dollars. You can publish your own book and, and get that book up there and to the masses as well. Uh, so there are different ways where you can generate revenue um, simply by having uh, a know-how in writing. So writers, bloggers, you can become a consultant. And we're really basically, you let others know how you can help them. You know, many doctors are utilizing their own skills and what they know. For example, let's say you're in a, you worked in a clinic. Perhaps you're involved in the marketing of it. Or perhaps you're involved in billing. Perhaps you know how to code correctly. These are all skills that other doctors would want to have. Uh, and other companies we want to have. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are always looking for consultants to involved in trials and uh, someone to oversee and give, give their aspects. Startups, uh, clinical trials. What can you do to help others? I have a whole course on physician consulting, um, but it's something where, you know, other, other areas, other companies, other people do um, to find more work on the side. There's no reason why you can have a full-time job have a website, say, hey, this is what I do. They come across it. It starts a conversation. You never know what it leads. There's, there's there, you know, what, you know, what, uh, what can you do? There's no, nothing you can do right now. You can have a full-time job, have a website out there, and an email address where it starts conversations. You never know where it can lead to. And really, at the end of the day, um, writer, blogger, consultant, these are just examples of being an entrepreneur, you know, creating your own products, creating your own services, writing, where um, you're basically um, uh, own your, you're writing your own ticket. And for that to have a job, what's the salary for an entrepreneur? It really is limitless. And it can lead to a lot of different opportunities. And as for in my life, you know, it could possibly be in for yours. Uh, again, just to give an example. Some of us like the uh, um, importance about being an employee, and that's fine, and that's good. But that you know, there are a lot more opportunities that are out there. So um, that pretty much concludes my uh, talk. Um, if you find it useful, I'm a big believer in positive feedback. <laughs> so if you can, uh, you know, put something in the comments that you enjoyed this or like to hear more talks like this. Um, in just conclusion, if you're if there's somebody who uh, you know wants some help on it, I'll do a little bit of a, a I've got a course coming up uh, that I've been doing. Uh, I do a course about once a year, uh, working with doctors who are interested in uh, uh, being an entrepreneur and uh, being uh, and using the internet and understanding the different aspects uh, of the internet. Um, and what I've really found is. Really, to succeed, you need to have some type of mentor or someone who's kind of been there, done that. And that really leads you to different paths between success and failure. Because a lot of these things that I'm teaching you, 
seems common sense. For, for me, I didn't know it until I actually experienced it and paid thousands of dollars. And really what it comes down to is having a plan in place. And what I'm seeing in non-clinical jobs is there's, there's not really a path just because there's so many different directions. But there are certain steps, there are certain milestones that you need to take. For example, like we just mentioned about having like a job assessment that you need to have before you take that next step. Um, so I have a, a course that's coming out um, and it'll be starting in the next couple of weeks. It's called the uh, Starting Point and it's five weeks to non-clinical career success. And basically what we're doing, it's a live uh, webinar and you can learn from the comfort of your own home. Uh, once a week, there's involved homework assignments that you do. We'll be in communication with one another, but uh, you know, I'll be online. Um, where we go through each step, each week we'll go through a different path. So the first week we're going to be covering, you know, just putting everything together. And then subsequent weeks we're going to focus on writing, what we need to be involved, how do you create a blog, what are the places that you need to be marketing to, how do you get more content, how do you get more information. Uh, third, uh, next week is how to become a physician consultant. Uh, how to develop your, uh, you know, what website you need to do to put your resume out there. How should you position your resume? Uh, I do this about once a year. This I'm really excited about this because I'm really focusing on non-clinical careers on this time. Uh, it's an all-new curricula, and uh, I've been doing this uh, courses since 2007. You can go to my website at income.md on some doctors who've taken my courses. Um, there are a lot of different courses. I wouldn't say a lot of different courses, but there are, certainly there are some courses. For example, there's a course that's put out by uh, a writing course that you could take. Uh, there's another course you, that you could take. And a lot of them do cost thousands of dollars. You have to travel there. Um, some of them, a lot of them are really good. Some of them are not, in my opinion. Um, some of them, I think, are a waste of your time, in my opinion. And, and uh, uh, But uh, I, I made the course uh, because... One of the things that I promised my mom is that I would help others. And one of the things I'm really passionate about is, is doctors helping other doctors. And I feel that's, that uh, uh, we've lost something. There used to be what was known as professional courtesy and that, uh, um, and that uh, you know, you, you give a break or you, you other you know, doctors help other doctors. But for some reason, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's specialist versus primary care. I don't know what it is. Somehow we lost that under there. Um, but my job is to help more doctors. So um, I'm putting it uh, this course uh, together. Again, I'm busy enough. <laughs> it's on there. But I'm, I'm making it pretty affordable, too, as well. Uh, the course itself is uh, $395. Uh, it's done completely online. And I'll give you the link if you want to do it. But I'm going to give a special link uh, for you guys uh, because you're on the webinar. And I'll leave this page up. It's got income.md slash start. It's going to give you 50%. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's about 195, if I'm doing my math correct, um, it's for five weeks. Um, you know, it's per hour. It's probably less than uh, than a uh, a dinner for two uh, per week per uh, each week. Um, so, but if you're looking to kind of uh, needs a direction, needs some guidance into uh, going into non clinical careers, uh, be sharing your strategies that only I use that just some of my uh, colleagues have used to help them in, in their non-clinical careers. And I work for everybody from entrepreneurs to medical writers to people involved in public policy, people who got into medical education, uh, people you know, who become CEOs of uh, uh, CME companies. Uh, I've, I've, I've got to work with a lot of different ranges of different doctors who moved into different things. Um, so I've seen a lot of things that uh, most other doctors, consultants may not have seen. So if this is something that you want to pursue further, uh, just go to income.md slash start, uh, S-T-A-R-T, and uh, you can purchase it right there. Um, I can make this available uh, probably for the next 10 people who want to join up, and then it's going to be uh, released at a uh, regular price uh, soon after that. So. Um, if you found this useful, just go ahead and post it. Um, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Really, I really, uh, oops, you said Lynn, sorry, called the wrong name. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I will uh, make the recording available sometimes if it did record, if you missed any of this. Um, I hope it was worth your time. Uh, hope you got some nuggets out of that. 
Uh, whatever you do, uh, you know, always kind of, it's, you know, always try to go in the, in the, in the, in sharing things and to understanding is that if we don't do it, if doctors don't help other doctors, no one is really going to help us on in there. So, um, you know, to go into some of these doctor forms out there, there's a lot of bashing. I was tired of that. Try to go in a sense of positivity and, and, and keep proving this. And if you find this useful, or even if you didn't find it useful, but maybe you have a colleague uh, who, who might find this useful, feel free to uh, forward them that information, and I'll be happy to uh, check it out. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, drop me a line. You can find me at income.md, and uh, my contact information is there. And if you want to join up on this course, um, oh, and for some, I see a few have already purchased it. Perfect. Uh, you'll be getting an email uh, uh, on you and tell you when the course is starting. Uh, it's starting like it's starting in the next week or so, and uh, the times. And we do try to make the times available. Um, that uh, if you can join us live, that's great. Uh, but I do try to do these on off hours for many of us, like on a weekend or a late week night, uh, so if you can. Uh, but if you happen to miss a few weeks. Uh, all of it's recorded, and uh, you can always catch up if you need to. So that's uh, starting point five weeks in on clinical career success. It's our online uh, training course. You can have the price off now if you go to that uh, website. So that being said, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining me on the call today, and I really uh, thank you uh, for spending time. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take uh, personal questions, but uh, again, feel free to. Check out my website, and until next time, I uh, hope everybody has a lovely weekend, and take care.